Well, let me, let me just ask some questions, and Bill, maybe I'll start with you. Uh, in the days, you know, you know, in the days when you and I uh, were lads, uh, the, uh, the world had passed through, uh, you know, let, let me give some, just some sort of gross world historical transformations. Uh, there had been capitalism uh, with all its uh, successes and all its ills, uh, and you know that in the 19th century, capitalism had called into existence a counterforce. We have many names for it. I suppose you'd call it the social democracy movement if you were in Europe or something like that. The idea that you can't leave the world merely to the play of private self-interest because there's too many public interests that can't be served that way. And so we developed the idea, you know, the state, in the, uh, the, the idea of the state in the United States, the main function of the government used to be coll to collect tariffs. Uh, but in the wake of this, we developed the idea that there's the private world of self-interest, and then there would be the p world of public interest, which is served by the state. So the state takes responsibility for welfare, for social security, for education, for things of that sort. Uh, and I suppose we would say we arrive at the moment of your mature career when suddenly the idea opened up that there was a third space or something of that sort, right? Uh, that, uh, that, that the state wasn't the ideal person to solve problems since it tended to associate them with bureaucracy and inertia and all kinds of things. Uh, so you had the idea that you could bring the skills associated with private for-profit work into a private space where the public good could be supported. I mean, this is, this is my brief account of sort of how, what I think of you. Uh, tell, me, tell, me, sort of, tell me how that idea came, you know, tell, tell me about like, okay, it's, it's the middle of the night and suddenly you see the dawn. <laughs> I mean, tell me, tell me about the sort of early phases of thinking through that possibility. Um, <laughs> it, it's really an incredibly simple idea. And it, I, know, I was 19, I went to India, saw what the statistics meant. And, you know, being an entrepreneur, you, what are you going to do about it? Uh, well, sophomores in college uh, don't control a whole lot. And so you're looking for what's the most highly leveraged way. And so the question that anyone would ask, uh, what's the most powerful force for change that you can think of? Well, it's always a big idea, pattern change idea, but only if it's in the hands of an entrepreneur. It's that combination that moves history, regardless of sector. And if you could help more of the social entrepreneurs, a phrase that actually pre-existed, but it's not well known, um, uh, get started and succeed. And then you could create a community of them which further multiplies the impact. A very, very small investment could actually accomplish a lot. Um, and that's especially true if you focus at a moment in the life cycle of the idea and the person when they finish their apprenticeship. I mean, you, you, don't have, you don't know what the next step for education or human rights is just like that. You have to really know the field, the people, the institutions, the anthropology, the technology, the whole thing. And you have to have figured out how do you cause large scale structural social change, which is complex. It's much more complicated than being a lawyer or an engineer. Um, but there's no school for it, even at Duke yet, although we're getting there. Um, and uh, so eight or 10 years on, you know you have an idea. You know this is the next step for the field. But who are you? And what is this idea? And the more interesting the idea is, the less it fits the existing structures. And the more you have to step out of the existing structures. And then, you know, how do you get support? and such little things as, you know, my godmother for decades could not tell her friends what I do. I know Bill is sort of a lawyer, but not quite. Uh, it was all very awkward for her. Well, and that's just a problem for us. Um, so our idea was a really simple one. Let's find a word. Let's create a system that will identify the great ideas and entrepreneurs, help them get started stipend for what turns out an average three years. You know, you quit your job, you've got to work on the prototype. It doesn't work quite right to begin with. You modify it. 
You've got to build a legal institution. You've got to figure out how to explain this idea. Well, it takes an average of three years to go through that. After which, you know, like everyone else, you have to struggle, but the funding comes because it's a really powerful idea. But from that beginning point on, you build a community. Um, it's very lonely being an entrepreneur anywhere, even in the US, uh, let alone in Indonesia. Try being a social entrepreneur in Indonesia in the 1980s. There's no, not even the remotest concept of what this is, and it's contrary to the culture, not supposed to upset people. Well, let me take you back to your early days, because the whole point is there was a time when the concept wasn't well established as a concept. I mean, that's one of your claims to fame, is that you helped to, to stabilize, to communicate the concept of it. What helped you build the concept of it? Did you see people who were examples, and then you realized what that person is as a social entrepreneur? I mean, what, what, what were the sort of uh, the, the sparks, the stimuli to your being able to conceptualize this? Growing up in New York City, very liberating. Once you're allowed to cross the streets, you can go anywhere for free. Every different subway stop is a different country. Civil rights movement, which was a Gandhian movement, mm -hmm. very powerful, very hard for people not of our era to understand right. how powerful that was. That's right. um, uh, I hated Latin and math in elementary school, was terrible at them. Um, as you could probably tell, I'm not a football star. That was not in the cards. But getting to start things and change things, you can be really powerful, and that's a lot of fun. So all those things came together, and so mm -hmm. being a social entrepreneur is something I've always wanted to be. Without, okay. So you have okay. to figure out a word for it. It was and innate. As an undergraduate, we set up the Ashoka table for a discussion, meeting with people who organize to figure out, and that's where we really developed the phrase and the concept. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. As you look now, and you've seen people try to enact this ideal in many different areas, do you find there are sectors where entrepreneurship works and sectors where actually you wish it did, but it doesn't work so well? I, I, I think it's a matter of ripeness. We, we have a in effect, a really sensitive Geiger counter. When you get 100 or 200 leading social entrepreneurs across the world addressing an issue, that issue is ripe. Uh, the typical Ashoka fellow, at the end of five years, over half of them have changed national policy and three quarters have changed the pattern in their field. When you get a couple of hundred of these people from Poland to Nigeria to Japan, you know that the issue is going to come. And then the, tr the trick is, how do you see the patterns and move from the patterns mm -hmm. to the paradigm? Where is this field going? And then this is what we're just learning to do now, which is very exciting, is you build <coughs> collaborative entrepreneurship where several hundred of the world's leading entrepreneurs work together to tip the world to make this new paradigm happen. And so it's... That's a function of ripeness. I don't think there's any problem that entrepreneurs can't solve if it's ripe. Uh, then I guess I would rephrase my question, which is, would you give me an example of a ripe and an example of a not yet ripe problem? Well, ripe is easier. <laughs> <laughs> um, our paradigm of growing up is learn knowledge and rules appropriate for a static world, not appropriate for a world defined by the rate of change going up exponentially. In the world that we're in now and where a 15-year-old today will be certainly by the time she's 30, it's a world defined by whether or not you can contribute to change. You move away from hierarchies which are only possible when everyone's doing repetitive functions to a world where everyone has to be a part of a very flexible, fast-changing team of teams. You've got to be a player. To be a player in this world, you've got to be able to see change opportunities and be able to be comfortable with it and contribute to it. Well, that's a whole different paradigm of growing up. Um, and yeah, the elite schools do that, and Duke encourages it viz the people in this room, but that is not what happens in the typical high school or middle school in this country, or college for that matter. That's right. That's right. I, 
I, I agree with that. And I guess that raises another question that I have, which is uh, entrepreneurship is not, I mean, in a sense, it's the opposite of institu institutions, right? Institutionalization or something like that. Uh, and so uh, for me, this is really an interesting question. You will have ideas about it. How can education, how do formal education and entrepreneurship actually work together? Well, this is what the conference down the hall is about. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in a world where, given that rate of change, the systems are no longer stable. They're, they're changing just as fast as everything else. Well, the system can really go amok. Who's working to consciously make sure that the systems go, don't go careening off in some unfair or inefficient direction or both? So we're losing privacy now because the entrepreneurs and preventive surveillance and Moore's Law all make it easy. Well, who is going to fix that? You need a class of entrepreneurs who, because systems change, that means entrepreneurs. That, that's the definition. Uh, you need entrepreneurs to deal with system change. You need a class of entrepreneurs who are focused on the good of all. That's the purpose of their life. That's what a social entrepreneur is. We're not defined by being in education or human rights. We're in everything. When the system is stuck and is a mess and there's an opportunity to be better, you need a very powerful force that is focused on the good of all. You know, who are the allies of those entrepreneurs? The first ally should be the universities the best people in religion, the traditional institutions that are focused on the good of all. And those institutions have an opportunity to recognize this historical moment and be a big player or not. And those who are big players, and Duke is clearly well on the way and committed, they're going to be, they're going to be the places that contribute real value. They'll be the leaders. And it's contributing value on this dimension that makes the difference. So take this redefinition of what growing up is about. Lots of different faculty here are concerned about parenting. They're concerned about poverty. They're concerned about researching and teaching sociology and history and management. All of that's affected by this redefinition. Well, is the university going to be a really big player? I hope so. If it, it, we need the universities as the entrepreneurs are really good at spotting and defining uh, these, these major new knowledge action combinations. And then the question is, can we work out an alliance so that the universities are working with us to take these new paradigms? And there's a lot of work. You know, how do you understand the psychology? How do you change the institutions? How do you measure the impact of the results? How do you spread these ideas? The universities are really important for all of this. And so that's what the Ashoka U collaboration between, we're, we're very consciously trying to do is to figure out how to find on each campus the people who care about this, who will take leadership. We don't care if they're students or alumni or administrators or faculty or what department they're in. The people who want Duke to be a, a a change maker campus who want to contribute to the history, we want to find them and work with them and link them with other people, both you know, into this, the social entrepreneur gotcha. field and the other campus is very important. Well, let me ask Polera a question. Uh, okay, you went to business school, I'm guessing. Yeah, uh, and when you joined the faculty of a business school, I'm guessing it had a far more traditional concept of what business education consisted of and I'm guessing it didn't have that much to do with what we just heard, yeah. right? Uh, so I guess, I guess I'm sort of asking you, you're a, a practitioner, but also in a, in a way a theoretician of business education. Uh, how, you, you know, what's, what rela what's the relation as you think of it between traditional business education and this kind of training of entrepreneurial agents? So, I mean, I actually think there's two issues, one of which, um, people might be surprised at. So when I first arrived, there, there, we, we had a love affair with the entrepreneur. I mean, the, the, in the early 1980s, the, 
notion of someone building something new mm -hmm. was all vogue. Right. Um, the other thing that was vogue at the time was uh, how do we effectively compete with Japan. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But, but uh, what was interesting in that is that the assumption was that the only form of entrepreneurship that exists in the world is a form of entrepreneurship that begins greenfield. Right. Right. And I think one of the things that's at the heart of social entrepreneurship is in some ways an odd respect for institutions. Right. That there are these things in the world that make life better and make us better. Right? I think Duke actually represents that. I think there are institutions that because of their existence, we aspire to do things we wouldn't do if they didn't exist. And they get bad, right? They get out of connection, they get out of function, and they actually stop serving their, the needs of society. They stop, they stop epitomizing what it means to be best. And in some ways, they start representing what it means to be stale and old and not good. Right. And then I think that, that one of the things that social entrepreneurship has done is actually re-energize the premise of entrepreneurs whose job is to remake institutions. Mm -hmm. right? um, rather than, in, in a sense, I came at the tail end of the 60s, and, um, and, and when, I was, uh, when I was growing up in that era, there was this notion, let's tear down. Right, and there was never a question of what do you replace it with. There was never there was. It was a very naive notion, which is if we tear it down, it will just be better. De novo. And it turns out, if you study human history, if you tear it down, all you replace it with is something very, 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 very bad. Until we get and, and so the real issue is how do you reinvigorate? How do you improve? So first piece is a thing that's come into the discourse is what does it mean to help institutions actually achieve what they should be achieving in the world? That's in a sense Gandhi's, I think, one of his contributions. And, and that is now front and center in much of what we do and teach. I think the second piece mm -hmm. is... And that would be true whether you were talking about someone going into a for-profit or a absolutely. what we would call not-for-profit. Yeah. Absolutely. I think the second piece is that, which is, for some reason, we developed a notion in business schools that your only purpose in life as an entrepreneur was to create wealth. Right. Right. And we lost the notion that you also had to be a citizen of the world. Right? Um, I mean, if you look at the great entrepreneurs in the, that, that we admired in the beginning of times, and you look at things like Edinburgh at its best, for example, people actually had a very clear understanding from whence their wealth came. Right? That, that you, by being an, all entrepreneurs were successful because the society in which they were embedded permitted them to be successful, and that they're actually people whose lives and whose choices helped them do so. And that actually your job was to make the system in which you were embedded better at the same time that you were, you were actually getting wealthy. Mm -hmm. um, we had lost that in some ways. We had sort of said wealth is the sine qua non, and we had forgotten that actually improvement of society that allowed other people to do the same was part of your objective. I think that's come back into business schools with a vengeance and I think the reason it's come back is actually students would, won't let us do otherwise. I mean, they, the student who now comes to Fuqua says, it is not just my goal to be wealthy. And some of them don't have that as a goal at all. They have as a goal to, to, to make the world sure. work better. But even those who say it is my goal to be wealthy, I only want to be wealthy the degree to which I actually make life better for everyone whom I'm affecting in the decisions I'm taking. That's pretty new. Yeah. Um, one is, I think, being driven by the academy. The other one, I think, is being driven by the students. Gotcha. Uh, so, so just tell me in practice, you know, I never went to business school. Uh, so uh, just tell me in practice, like, the, the people who are interested in case mm -hmm. and the rest of the students, there's no bifurcation then, what you're saying, because there's a kind of, there, there's a kind of identity. I mean, the way you describe it, there's an identity of interest or an identity of aim and hey. even of training. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I mean not, no, I don't think there's an identity of training, but let me sort of two things that might be surprising. The largest club at Fuqua by two to one is social impact, right? Now, it turns out that many of the members of that club have no affiliation with CASE other than through that club, right? They don't want to be social entrepreneurs. They don't intend to start making very little right. money when they graduate. They intend to work for McKinsey when they graduate and be prohibitively well-paid. Okay. Um, uh, but, but actually, they have in their core some desire to actually contribute to the world at the same time that they're being successful in their own careers. 
Um, and so they've joined Social Impact. If you look at the size of Social Impact as a club 10 years ago, it didn't exist actually, right? Um, so you went from nothing to this largest by an order of two in 10 years, mm -hmm. right? Um, and everyone is a member, the kids who want to go to banking, the kids who want to go into consumer, the kids who want to be entrepreneurs in IT, they're all part of it and, and they're a vibrant part of it. Second thing is that you're also seeing an emergence of dual degree students in a way that we haven't ever seen before. So students are getting masters of public policy and MBA because they believe that actually business will help them achieve in policy fields in ways they hadn't before, which is really one of the elements of your first answer, Mr. Retina. Second is you get these students in Master of Environmental Management and MBA, because right. they actually believe the way to solve environmental problems is by being an entrepreneur with a business bent. And, and I'm actually deeply proud of those movements. It's, it's incredibly interesting to see this. I mean, certainly this university gives us a lens to see it. The way the kind of person who would have described their uh, future career as humanitarian, the way they now want the management skills and even the financial skills. Uh, exactly. uh, because, you know, we've, the world has paid a certain price uh, for having humanitarians uh, be only those people with no managerial skills, right? <laughs> well, I mean, so it's, so it's a question of how do you bring these, how do you actually bring these two these two things together. Uh, okay, so this panel is called uh, uh, the, the Ethics of Global Development, and I haven't really asked any development questions yet. Uh, but, I, but, but thinking of, of uh, being on the panel with you, Bill, and with that question, and then I've been, you, know, you think about the Middle East these days and things like that, I guess I, this is a question I just would be very interested in learning your answer to. D uh, are there social preconditions for successful social entrepreneurship? Does it require certain states of political freedom? Does it require the existence of certain forms of infrastructure that are already in place? Does it require certain forms of education? Or is it something that is universally available uh, to, to everybody everywhere? I think there are two answers as usual. It, it, there's a huge difference. It's really hard to be a social entrepreneur in Burma. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, we can't function there, but Ashoka Fellows from Bangladesh and India and Thailand do function in Burma mm -hmm. because social entrepreneurs don't respect boundaries. Correct. Um, but it is much harder to function in Burma than in Thailand. Right. Uh, so the circumstances really do make a difference. Uh, but I think what, there's something deeper than those differences, and that is that everywhere in the world, without exception, we are entering the awareness tipping and tipping process to an everyone a change maker world. The, the world of hierarchies, where most people, 98, 99% are doing repetitive functions, farmers, assembly line, that's gone. Going very fast, won't be with us in 10 or 15 years, except as minor exceptions. And that doesn't matter whether you're in Burma or China or here mm -hmm. or Nigeria. Of course, it does matter how quickly each society adjusts. Uh, it makes a big difference whether you're living in Burma or a Silicon Valley, in a Detroit or Silicon Valley now. Many of the industrial cities that were hugely profitable and successful and proud 50 years ago are gone because they missed the last transition. And the next one won't take 50 years. We'll be lucky if it's 15 years. And so the key factor for success, I think, for any society is what pro will be, increasing the already is, what proportion of the people are change makers, at what level, and how well do the institutions and the society enable them to work together. So if you're a change maker, you don't go to Sioux City with all due respect to anyone who's from there, or Detroit, you go to the former lemon groves of Silicon Valley because the other change makers are there and because the institutions are keep competing to invent a better and better environment for change makers okay. to work together. Now, so that's universal, everyone gets a choice. Do you want to be Silicon Valley or do you want to be Detroit? And we, I mean, everyone here can really make a big difference in making sure that a much higher proportion of the world <coughs> ends up in Silicon Valley 
and not uh, Detroit. Okay, th but this is a fascinating answer, but it raises interesting questions, because in a way, you suggested a person is equally capable of social entrepreneurship everywhere, though the conditions set limits on the potential su success of it. But then when you talk about migration, uh, then it suggests ch uh, change makers can come from anywhere, but you're not gonna find them everywhere, because they're gonna go to the places where you can make most change. So you know this article by uh, Richard Florida called The World is Spiky? Uh, that the idea of, that if you, the, uh, it's, it's his reply to the idea that the world is flat. And the idea is that actually if you look at the world in terms of where are uh, scientists with PhDs, where are patents filed and stuff like that, uh, you get a much more hierarchized world uh, than we are, have ever been familiar with, even in the days when you drew maps of wealth or something like that, because there are very small number of places that have huge assets of this regard. Uh, so I guess I'm just asking you, I mean, because uh, I think you, this is the, what you said is the first time it ever occurred to me that the world where everyone is a change maker could be the world where all of a sudden some places end up as the, what would we say, the paradises of change making. You know, how, how would you like, how, what are you envisioning will, Sioux Falls will be, to use your own example a minute ago? Well, I, I'm very optimistic. Uh, a century ago, let alone 1300, virtually no one was literate. It was a minority. And we have gotten the world in a very quick period to almost universal written literacy because that became essential to function in the society that we've already built. The sort of skills I've been referring to, empathy, teamwork, leadership, change making, four very complicated learned skills, people can learn that. And you know, when we say everyone a change maker, a lot of people say in the back of their mind, well, okay for us, but not those people. And the reason they say that is that those people, in fact, would find it very difficult to make the change now as adults. But had they had the same childhood that we did, they could have. And so I really do believe that everyone can and that the spiky world is going to get a lot less spiky because at the moment we have islands where the new world exists. And there, this is classic when you go through a transition. You, you've got a few places that start doing it well. Sure. And they don't do it that well, but they're getting better every year. And so you've got these spikes, and, but then they get networked together, the web being an example. So you would think like the Industrial Revolution, first you had it like in Manchester, and then you had it in like six places, but then actually that process could be spread out more generally. Right, okay, so the, and, and so that's, that's what you would see, the sort of Silicon Valley would be not, the, not, not an index to a world where things were gonna be tighter and tighter zones of sort of monopoly of change, but that that would be the sort of beginning of something that would be much more broadly diffused. But th there is a nightmare lurking here, and that is that we could leave large parts of humankind behind. Indeed. We've got maybe 25, 30 percent who have really not mastered the most fundamental key skill, which is a high level of empathetic skill. When, you, when the world changes quickly, rules cover less and less. They haven't been invented, they're in conflict. And we were simply have to rely on the people around us having a very sophisticated skill to understand all the people around them layers out into the future in groups. And if they don't, they're gonna hurt you and they're gonna hurt your institution. You don't want anything to do with them or their group if the group doesn't have this skill. And one contributor to the worsening income distribution all across the world, regardless of system or size or continent, I think is that those people who have these skills are in huge demand. And those who don't are not in demand. They're in negative demand. And so right. you're getting a drawing apart, which could be terribly destructive. Mm -hmm. And we see things like that. I'm just going to ask one last question, and I'll ask it to both of you. Uh, of all the things there are to do in the world, I live my life in a university. Uh, and universities obviously have, have relations to all the things we're talking about. Even, you know, we don't, we don't have a major in empathy, uh, but in the sense of the word that you're using it, I would say it's one of the natural functions of universities. They're places that gather people who have intelligence in common and nothing else. 
Uh, and therefore, people have to learn to work with each other, to learn how to learn how other people think, uh, to teach people how you think, uh, and just how to do, uh, you learn how to negotiate the world of swirling, changing otherness, right? Which is, in a sense, the world you say we're all, we're all, we're all going to live in. Uh, so I'm just so I'm just wondering, and I can imagine a, ver a version, I can imagine a version of what we're discussing where universities would be more important than ever, right? I mean, they're, they're places that give people the knowledge they can then use to be effective change agents. They give people the skills of flexibility, mobility, human interaction, things of that sort. Uh, but I must confess, when I first hear the idea of social entrepreneurship, I understood or misunderstood uh, that there are people who aren't going to want to spend too much of their life in institutionalized settings. Right? Because they want to be entrepreneurs. Like, think of Blair. You were a business professor, but then you wanted to found the school. Right? See what, see what I'm but saying? Came back to an institution. You came, but, you came, but you came back to it. Or, or maybe yours, uh, you suggest another model, which is uh, that entre uh, what you said before, that entrepreneurship can, can, be involved in invest in, can be invested in institutions and not only the opposite of institutions. So, so let, me, let me start, if I can. Um, I think that there's a couple of pieces, which is take the skills that Bill described. I think those are, you could think of as entry stakes, right, to being an effective entrepreneur. Um, mm -hmm. And I do right. actually okay. think that universities are better at worse at producing those. And I think we're trying very hard at Fuqua to actually create those as features okay. of every student we graduate. I mean, we, for example, one of the things a school would do that does that is be student-led rather than institution-led, because the students would have to learn to work with each other and build their own systems as part of the process. Another one would be to get them engaged in a way that, that don't keep them behind the IV walls, but actually get them in the world That's engaged. Right. So, right. And then have them reflect on that so they learn. So there's, there's choices universities make to help accelerate the development of those four That's right. features of a human being. That's right. I think there's another thing that universities do, though, which is those skills have no value without insight. Right? The, right. the, 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 the question is, what, what an entrepreneur does is not just exercise those skills to be successful. They actually have insights the rest of us don't have that's right. about where there's some leverage in the world. That's right. Right. Um, and I think that that's actually one of the real contributions of university. That the, uh, and I think it gets harder now, though, because it's, it, it used to be the case that insight could come from actually understanding any one of the disciplines tremendously well and sort of what was missing in a discipline, right? Now I think insight comes from understanding the interplay between those disciplines. It, under, it, it comes from understanding a more systemic view. Okay. And, and I don't know that all of us in, our, in universities are doing as good a job of helping people learn the system in which the various disciplines are embedded, right? So for example, at Fuqua, we pass people through every discipline. The assumption is they figure out how to integrate that in their own head, right? That's, th that's the assumption of university education. I think that's a fairly weak yeah. assumption, by the way. I, I mean, I, it's a pretty big assumption, yeah. you're right. <laughs> and, and because it turns out the integration of that is more complicated than it used to be for a whole bunch of reasons you just described. And therefore, it is incumbent upon us to actually create an overlay in that that actually causes people to say, how does all of this fit together? And in particular, how does it fit together with an empathy for people who aren't at Duke, right? So for example, one of the projects our students are engaged in is rainforest in Indonesia and coral in Indonesia. And this is a really important project because it turns out that the coral in Indonesia is a third of the world's lungs. And what's occurring is that people are increasingly destroying their future because they're using concussion bombs and cyanide to float the fish to the surface so they then put them in a boat because they're easy to get and then bring them home. And then they move out further every year and what happens is they kill coral, they kill coral, they kill coral, and eventually there'll be no coral. And that will hurt us in two ways. Those people have no livelihood and the world will have no lungs. Right? If you're actually gonna act on that problem, you have to have all of the, and you're gonna be a Duke student who helps act on that problem. You're gonna have to have all the features that Bill described. You're going to have to have tremendous insight about what causes that little microeconomy to work the way it is. And then you're going to actually have to be able to get yourself in the head of someone who you've right. never met, right. whose background you've never experienced, That's whose right. religious orientation is completely different from your own, right. and who has a view of an economy that's radically different from your own. 
right? So the level of empathy that's required is astounding to pull that off. And then you have to have both the commitment and humility to actually help someone else help themselves, right? I, I, that's tough to teach, but actually I think, you know, two people in the front row are actually That's doing a pretty good job of it, by the way. Okay. That's good. That's good. What should I have been asking? <laughs> Sir. I have a question. Um, there are many of us here, particularly on the Duke and Death weekend, who spent a career working in the trenches, so much, much as you did with, with McKinsey, who would really like to participate in a more meaningful manner um, in helping to promote this and taking the insight that we've gained through our careers, but to participate more meaningfully than just, shall we say, throwing money at the problem, which is typically how we're asked to participate. And so I, I would ask you, Bill, um, what advice or what ideas could you share with us about ways to engage meaningfully together to address some of these issues? It's a really good question, and if I may say it, it's, it opens up a, a question of what can the university do at this moment in history more generally. So the alumni are a really important group of people important to the university and to the world. So there's some very simple things that I think the university could do. Uh, virtually everyone who is alumnus cares about a young person somewhere in their life, their daughter, their granddaughter, a friend, whatever. Uh, you don't have to change the whole system to do a better job of being a friend, a parent to that 15-year-old. Uh, you can help that. And the university can help every alumnus, for the faculty members as well, uh, understand that when she says, Dad, something is a mess, you know, the, the way uh, students who don't speak English so well are being treated in the school, the way this park is, or whatever, you can say to that 15 year old, Well, why don't you get your friends together and fix it? Me? Yes, and by the way, this is the most important thing you can do because this is helping you get the skills that you have to have. This is, this is the ticket to the game of being able to contribute. Now, any parent can do that. If you and Duke, this community could help the Duke alumni just understand that, that would be a huge contribution. Uh, if you were active in a religious house, you could take that insight and help the religious house you're a part of, help all the parents, help the children in that community, young children master empathy and the teens empathy. But what is religion supposed to do if not help people learn how to be good people and master these skills? Uh, you could play a role there. Um, if you're a manager in an institution, is that institution going to make the transition from a hierarchical structure to be a genuine team of teams? It's a big change. Any one of the people here could contribute to that because we're all part of some institution we care about. The first institution in any sector that figures out how to do this is going to stress all the other institutions, whether it's a hotel or a human rights organization. Mm -hmm. Because an everyone a change maker hotel company will see many more opportunities and develop them faster and they'll draw people who have this set of skills to it. Now, if you're running a business school, you know, is the business school making sure that everyone coming out of the business school is thought about what a team of teams is and how would you manage that differently? And what does, the, the, really, I, I'm actually talking to a guy who owns a very large hotel company about this at the moment. You know, he has 90,000 employees. They are all, he treats them the way Henry Ford told them to. You know, you put the toiletries here and you don't talk to anyone you certainly don't think. Well, what if he had 90,000 people who were looking at the market? Now, what could this company do? Well, Condé Nast gave us one wonderful statistic which floored this guy. 55% of travelers would consider having their prime vacation be for social learning 
social service and learning, and 24% want it. How many hotel companies know about that market need? Well, the first one who has their employees engaged looking at that and figuring out how to do that, and we'd be thrilled to work with them. I mean, I'd love to have this hotel chain be a distribution channel into their communities. I mean, it would be great. Well, that company is going to be so much better off and the others will have to follow. That's part of the mechanism of how we're going to get why this is a 10, 15 year proposition because there are going to be entrepreneurs. You could be one of them. So thinking about the alumni again, helping with parent, helping you be a better parent or grandparent, helping you be a better manager, a better board member for a vestry or whatever, the university could play that role. How many people, I mean, people don't die at 40 anymore and they're bored, most of them, or many of them. I mean, how many years do you want to be a lawyer? Well, due respect to lawyers. Um, or a manager or whatever it is. Um, how many people can make the transition you're referring to? They don't know how to. Well, what if the university offered to help its alumni map out how to make that transition? I mean, Profession, you know, high skilled people don't really want to go and lick envelopes and they have no idea what strange language. I mean, it's also a problem to move from agriculture to electronics, which is both technically business. But if the university offered this, which it could do, and if even just a few percent of the alumni took advantage, you would be building the loyalty of the alumni and the death and, and the, the commitment to the university in a really important way. So I, mean, I, I just think. Your, your, your question opens up a whole array of possibilities. Let me, um, there are some things we're trying and some things we're starting and stalling, but, but there's movement in them. And so let me give you a few examples. There's a group in public policy who are actually looking at uh, what's happening in philanthropy and how it's evolving. And, and what they're discovering is that people in philanthropy actually don't give money anymore. They give money and get engaged, right? Now, it turns out the challenge in that is that if you have a huge amount of money, that's easy to do. If you have a small amount of money, that's harder to do. So the question becomes, how do you create sort of equity pools of people who have similar interests, who, who both put the money and their time into that equity pool? That's evolving. We're helping think through what that would look like. What's really interesting in that is that that's a thing that started in public policy, but actually very quickly becomes an interesting business school problem, right? And so we're starting to look at what does that look like? Um, second thing is that, is that we have every school in the university in some ways getting our students more and more engaged in fundamental issues in the world, right? There's a formal activity at the undergraduate level called Duke Engage. We have things called global consulting projects. They're exactly the same issue though, which is how do you get students taking the things they've learned in the classroom, trying to make sense of them in the world at large, and, and actually then reflect on what they learned from that. There are two real problems that we're seeing in the business school related to that issue. The first one is sustaining the relationship with the people you're trying to help when the student comes home. Right? The, the problem in part is an intervention itself makes a change and, and not sustaining that actually produces a cynic recipient of that change. And so one of the issues is how can we use alums to sustain things over time so that we don't actually produce cynicism in those we're in theory trying to help. Right. Um, and how do we bring wisdom to bear in that process? So we're trying to figure out what that looks like in a way. And we're stumbling and we're not doing a great job. But but turns out you have wisdom that our students don't have. One of the things that's really critical is a point that Bill raised, which is you have to let them stumble. You're not letting them learn. So a, a fear we have is you're just going to get in and do it for them. Right. Um, but, but so the question is, how do we engage alums around that question? And we're, and we're, we're, we're beginning in that. And then the final one is, um, <laughs> A project that was started, I guess, about three years ago, stalled and I think is getting re-energized, is a sort of premise around bringing all of the disciplines of the university to bear against some really major issues in the world, right? Um, and and uh, getting faculty as constituents, students as constituents, and alumni as constituents working on that, right? We started on this notion of how do you accelerate health development in Africa and we just couldn't bring all the forces together as well as we should. That's been re-energized in lots of different ways and there's no question 
that alumni can be a partner in that process as we do it. So if you take the theme of health and equity in the world, take the theme of energy and environment, take the theme of, entrep of encouraging entrepreneurship in places where it's not happening, we're doing those as a university and we can't just do those as faculty and students. We need people in the world to help us and you're in that world. You know, alums have something even more valuable than money to give, which is experience. The things you can only know through experience. Uh, and I think that one of the great, uh, only partially solved uh, uh, mysteries is how can we connect the experience and generosity of intention of people who've been at a school to those who are younger and full of promise but don't have the experience. You know, how, how, that's, that's a, uh, I, I, I'm gonna wager that 10 years from now, will be uh, a, a person looking 10 years forward from now will be amazed at how rapidly that field fills in in the future, because I mean, in a world where communication is so much, so radically easier, it's just a question of figuring out how you, how you make people feel the mutual benefit that keeps it alive. So where's another one? Please. I think that was addressed to you. Okay. <laughs> sure it wasn't addressed to me. <laughs> um, it's a fabulous question. Uh, you, you need people changing at all levels. And we, we've just adopted the language entrepreneur to be clear that that's different, the people who cause system change. And we use the phrase everyone a change maker, not everyone an entrepreneur, because you need everyone. Each individual institution has to be constantly changing now. It needs people in it to make those adaptations. The process of empowering everyone with the skills and then the structures of how we manage institutions to make it easier and easier for people to be change makers is absolutely critical. So the entrepreneurs need the change makers and vice versa. And in fact, I think one of the most important things that the entrepreneurs do is that they're mass recruiters and enablers of change makers. Uh, the way people, you know, a social entrepreneur, this is one of the only areas in which there's a real difference with business. We have no incentive to jig a moat and keep competitors away. The goal is to change the world, and so what you do instead is you make your idea as simple and understandable and safe and where necessary supported as possible, precisely so that local people will stand up and say, oh, this is a good idea, and we need this here, and by God, this looks practical and we're going to do it. Well, not only does that give you the capacity to make your idea fly, because you're not going to run thousands of schools or health clinics or whatever it is, uh, but all those local people have suddenly become change makers and they become role models and recruiters and a few of them will be the next generation of entrepreneurs. So I, I don't think there's a conflict, there's a huge complementarity. And uh, uh, to the degree that people are critical of having masses of local change makers, just think about the pine tree. You know, all those cones and all the seeds, and you, it takes a lot of cones and seeds to get the next big pine tree. And it's a really good adaptive mechanism. So I have a question, uh, and, I, and I can only ask it this way. When everyone is a change maker, how do you agglomerate the changes? How, how, how do you take all the changes and make them add up to something more stable and more beneficial? How, how do you get out of the chaos model of, of, of change making? 
So can I put those two together, two questions together? And oh, then, yeah, but and I, want to, give them I want him to answer it. Don't let him I want to put the, I want to put the, I actually want to deal with, it because it turns out, the, um, I think the, the, one of the sources of the criticism are people who would actually do something that we know fails and has failed for 80 years. When you go in at the highest possible level and look at all of the interdependencies and you bring a ton of money to bear and you impose it from outside, all you do is make things worse. Right? The evidence is consistently clear to that. And so there are, there's, a, there's, a, there's a desired view to say, let's understand the whole system is an entire system and act on it and just make it better in one place. Turns out it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is no one's smart enough to actually know everything. Right? The evidence that's true is the fall of planned economies. Right? No one's smart enough to know everything. Right? And therefore, a better answer is to encourage as many people at a local level to solve their own issues. And then agglomerate wisdom from that. Because what happens is when I solve a little issue and another little issue and another little issue, I start to see how these things fit together as a system. And then I, and then I tackle the bigger question, which is what is it that's, what's, what's, the, what's the hidden thing that's causing all of these to occur? It's by, by agglomerating wisdom through each of those pieces that I develop that understanding. And you actually then develop inside at a local level, right? What you also then do is teach people how to organize together, right? And so I think one of the answers is that the organizing principles, that, that there's an implied threat to those of us who like organizing principles that exist today rather than organizing principles that will evolve tomorrow in a question that says, but how do all the change makers coordinate? The answer is they can only be change makers by evolving new coordination mechanisms. I mean, if you take a look at what's happening in Libya, people are coordinating in a way that they never could have coordinated before because of the advent of technology and a willingness to try that. That's pretty scary to Gaddafi, right? I think it's a good thing, not a bad thing, by the way. And, and actually what you're seeing is tremendous coordinated action. You're not seeing, you're not seeing mal-coordination. You're actually seeing organization at a pretty sophisticated level. So, sorry, now your turn, sir. <laughs> um, this is connecting the islands. Uh, we had a welcoming for the newest Ashoka Fellows at the Google Complex a couple of years ago. And three of the f five top managers there got up and said one of the main reasons they were interested in Ashoka is that we are working on solving precisely this problem, which is their chief problem. They have 25,000 people that they have selected to be, at least in an engineering sense, creative. And how do you get that to come together to create a few big things that will really change the world, produce real value, new products? Well, we have uh, the same challenge. And I think the single most important thing that has happened for the field in the last decade or so is, is that we are moving beyond the solo practitioner to collaborative entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And I, when you have a couple of hundred leading social entrepreneurs, you know the issue is ripe. You can see the patterns. And you select amongst the patterns those that are forward looking, that help you see what the new paradigm is. Once you know what the new paradigm, I just gave you an example in terms of growing up, a different definition of growing up. Then the challenge is how do we work together? Now we have 700 Ashoka fellows out of the 3,000 working on children and young people. They know how to help young kids grasp empathy, how to practice it. We know that. That isn't the problem. Now we've got to tip the world's thinking which is why we're here building the partnerships with the universities, because that's a key part of it. Uh, so what is our, just let me take the example of how, the, the first challenge is how do we make sure that every young child masters empathy? Any child that doesn't is out, that's the end of them. They can't go on to teamwork, they're going to be marginalized in life. Uh, this is very fundamental, so our goal is that Five years from now, 80% of the people who run elementary schools anywhere in the world will know that they're failing if they have one second grader who has not grasped empathy, and if all of them aren't practicing it. Uh, we know how to do this. Uh, in 20 hours you, over a year, 
we can take any first, second, third grader, and they will have grasped empathy, and they're not getting it at the home, they're not getting it in the street, they're not getting it in school. We now, they can practice it. We've got, you know, there are five or six fellows just in this country and in Canada who, are, who I could just summarize them now. This is something new. That we're not talking about entrepreneurs only as solo practitioners. But this is for the first time we have created a team. This is, you think of the world as a team of teams, the top tier has got to be the team of entrepreneurs working on the systems. And so for the first time, you're seeing the leading social entrepreneurs coming together to see the pattern, see the paradigm, and actively tip the world. If we can tip seven to nine countries, you can tip the world. So what do we have to do in this case? It'll be very concrete. We think we have to get 5% of the influential elementary schools to do it in the next three years. So there are 90,000 elementary schools in the US. We think we have to get 50 to 100 of the influential ones to do it. And we have to get 30 of, the, uh, excuse the phrase, mavens, people who are highly influential because they really, honest to God, deeply care about mastering a field they really know it, people know that they know it. We're giving them a new lens that they can use. They find that really valuable. And then they use it all the time. And of course, these people respect one another. And you combine the most influential schools and the most influential writers, scholars, publishers, and you can tip the system. Parents aren't going to resist. You just tell parents that this is really critical and here are some very simple things. Parents want their kids to succeed. Illiterate parent, parents all over the world are absolutely intent on making sure that their children master written literacy. Well, this is the next step beyond written literacy and the parents will be with us. But we've got to work together to make this happen. And, uh, you know, I can give you, we've got 12 of these collaborative entrepreneurship things going on, and I've just been using this one example. But I'll give you a, just as quickly a different example, and this is directly relevant to business school. Um, there are, we have this crazy system that's evolved historically. Business took off and became entrepreneurial and competitive and grew productivity and scale, and then globalization, the social sector was stuck. 1980, the citizen sector got unstuck and it's been catching up ever since. That's why we're growing jobs at two and a half, three times the rate of business across the OECD countries. I mean, it's, it's, it's within societies like China and India versus the US and Europe, because it's a catch up. Now, we're there. The gap is largely closed. You have the two halves that have the same architecture, but they don't talk to one another. They wear different clothing. They don't like one another very much. And it's very inefficient. So here's a, so what we've learned, there are 500 fellows dealing with full economic citizenship, making sure everyone can play in the economy. One of the first things we've learned is if you collapse these two separate business systems into one, you have a gigantic productivity deal. Everyone makes a lot of money and, you, and things move really quickly. Concrete example, we've, we've demonstrated this now in seven, three different industries, four continents. So here's one example. It started a year and a half ago in India. There are 24.7 million missing housing units for informal sector workers in the cities. It's a lot of houses missing. This is a big market failure. Why is it? Because the builders and the financiers, how do you deal with a guy who sells vegetables every day? There's no paper slips. So oh, the whole bureaucracy can't deal with it. And besides, it's a different class. And, uh, and they need houses that are 200 and 80 to, two, to 480 square feet. So it's a different market, but it's a real market. These people need these houses. Now, the citizen sector knows these people, there's trust, uh, their costs are low, but they are no good at real estate development and they can't get funding because the financing system for the social sector is so utterly sclerotic and hopeless. So market failure on both sides. Now, if you put the two together, all of a sudden, the citizen sector can do what they're really good at. They can figure out how to organize people and market and 
uh, select the right clients and do the retail and servicing and collection functions and they get paid for this. This changes the economic base of the citizen sector in a big way. These companies, now just give you the numbers, we have got 10,000 units constructed or under construction, uh, 120 million of private dollars in private funding. If you translate that to the whole existing 24.7 million units, that's a $240 billion unmet market, market failure that now we can solve. And that's before the 700 million people that are going to come into the country from the countryside, and that's before you take other countries into account. Mm -hmm. Now, and that's only new housing. What about upgrading housing? Well, we've demonstrated how to do that in Colombia. Same thing. Healthcare, same thing. Irrigation, same thing. Market failure after market failure because you have two business systems, business and social, that don't talk, but now they can. Well, that is an example, again, like the redefinition of what it takes to grow up. It's a very simple thing. What we want, we're not going to be in the business of building houses. That's not what Ashoka does. What we want in five years from now is that anyone who starts a new strategic scan, we don't care what sector, you know, religious, social, uh, uh, they should automatically think, is there an opportunity to collapse these two things into one? Or to improve the one that you've already started? And for those of you who like, what, how do you describe it? Every young boy wants to go to McKinsey. This is the best thing for management consulting in years. There are going to be 60 years of building and rebuilding hybrid value chains. Uh, and, and of course, we think of the consulting firms and the business schools and the finance pages as the three key people in this case, how do we tip the system? We've got to have the demonstrations. We've now done that. Now we need the business schools, the finance pages, and the consulting firms, an echo chamber of people who all listen to one another to go to work so that five years from now, anyone who graduates from the school is going to think, how do we collapse these things together? And they'll know what the next five questions are. And this is really big. This yeah. is really big. This is big. Uh, you put me in mind of something, and I think we're probably about at the end of this, and I'll just say it with this. Uh, some of you will remember being at the commencement of this university not many years ago when the student who gave the student commencement address was a kid who was Belgian, except he was actually Palestinian, but he had gone to high school in the United States, as is the typical way these days. Uh, and uh, I knew a friend of his marginally, uh, and when I went to India for the first time, I was in Mumbai, Blair and I were there together. Do you remember there was this kid who showed up at our reception uh, who, was, who was this kid's friend? Uh, he was an Indian student who had come as an undergraduate to Duke, and then he had been employed at McKinsey. Uh, he had worked at McKinsey in New York, then he had been able to go back and work in McKinsey in, in Mumbai, but now he was on loan from McKinsey to work on a housing project. Uh, and it was exactly addressed at this issue, which is you've got the parts of, parts of the city where there's this super valuable real estate uh, for some purposes that isn't available to be used for those purposes because no one can figure out how to put the interests uh, uh, together. Uh, and so that was his job at that point. Uh, so, I mean, I find this all, all quite interesting because, you know, we're talking about these things as if, you, you, you know, you could sort of sit there and move them around in space, uh, but you're suggesting that it won't always be in space that these ideas are moved around. Uh, and to me, it suggests an interesting thing, which is the day will come when we don't happen to have social entrepreneurship units inside business schools, but rather we will understand the nature of business in such a way that social entrepreneurship will be business, and business will be social entrepreneurship, uh, and that'll, and, and and at that moment, we might say universities will have a role and never a monopolistic role, because why would they wish it to be? Uh, I am grateful to my smart friends for being up here with me, uh, to all of you for coming. A very interesting discussion. Thanks. Thank you.